Good morning. If you could, if you could scoot all the way to the right, just if we got a few people standing on the wall, so just all the way to the right if you can. If there's room, how are we this morning? It's about what I thought after last night. Um, how many stayed up late to watch the Colorado Colorado State game? Foolish people. One thirty in the morning for that game. Um, my name's Garland. I'm glad to be with you this morning. I'm one of the pastors here. And um, it, there's one thing that when you think about, you know, human culture, whether this be through the arts or science or even like, like you know, nowadays with like sports and things like that, it's almost tragic. It can be frustrating. It can be maddening to consider people that were really, really gifted or maybe at the peak of their, their powers or the peak of their, uh, their gifting and trying to bring something into the world, but because of various circumstances, they weren't able to, to bring to the world all the impact that they might have otherwise if circumstances had been different. Like, uh, I recognize that this is one of the most famous scientists, made a huge contribution to how we understand uh, our universe today, Albert Einstein. But what is fascinating to me is for about a 12 to 18 month period in the early 30s, uh, he had to figure out where he was gonna live as he was exiled from his home country because of the rise of Nazism. And he's literally just trying to figure out where am I gonna live, where am I gonna work, how am I gonna make this all come together? And it makes me wonder, what does the world gain if for those 12 to 18 months he was able to focus on, uh, on the math and the study of the science that he was doing. Like, what happens if he's not just trying to figure out where he's going to live? What do we gain from that? Uh, classical music people, which I am not one of those, but uh, classical music fans, they often will say that Mozart's Requiem in D minor might be the greatest music, musician Musical piece? What do you call classical music? Song? Uh, the greatest musical piece ever written. But the sad thing is, it was never completed. Uh, Mozart had chronic fevers and chronic headaches, and so even on his deathbed, it was said he was trying to finish this masterpiece of, uh, of a piece of music. And it's not just in the arts, it's not just in science. Like, we can look in the sports world and go, you know, what would have happened? Like, what happens if Jordan never plays baseball? Like, I think the GOAT debate is already settled and in favor of Jordan, okay? LeBron fans, calm down. But what happens if he doesn't play baseball? Does he get eight rings, eight in a row? And then it's conclusive and decided. Like, I don't think we have many Jets fans in the room in here, but Jets fans, it's a hard week for you. Any Jets fans? One. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. Decades of mediocrity. And you get the all-time great, most talented quarterback I've ever seen. Pure arm talent. Four snaps. Tears his Achilles. Nothing more Jets fan than that. And now he's out for the season. And it's not just circumstances. Uh, it's sometimes it's the ultimate like the ultimate tragedy, like there's a, there's a name for this. It's called the Club of 27, the famous musicians who died at the age of 27. And I know there's various reasons why they, why they passed away early, but it makes you wonder, like what would have happened? What, what albums would they have created? What influence would they have had if they had lived on? Maybe another five years, 10 years, 30 years. Uh, maybe one more personal, uh, kind of close to home for me. Uh, this past summer, we lost Tim Keller. And he was a big influence on maybe many of us in the room. And one of the things that he, he, he had a life well lived, and so we celebrate that he's with Jesus now, but one of the things that kind of gnaws at me when, you know, an influential person like this that I really respected passes away, he passed away from pancreatic cancer is, let's say he had three more years. Like, what book or lecture series does he write or does he give that becomes really important and really instructive for me in my life, maybe for some of you as well? When we open up this letter, the letter to the Philippians, what we're going to see as we dive into it is we're going to see somebody at the peak of their powers Somebody who is, whether you're a skeptic in the room or a Jesus follower in the room, the influence of the Apostle Paul is beyond question. There are many, even non-Christians, that would acknowledge that one of the most influential people on Western culture is the person that wrote our letter. And what we're going to see as we dive into this letter is he's experiencing something a little bit surprising. You see, this 
influential person. He was a church planter. He was a pastor. He was a leader. Everywhere he goes, he's turning cities upside down. He was a movement creator. He had a massive impact on Western culture. And where do we see this man as he writes this letter? He's about 50 or 52 years old. He's probably got years, if not decades, ahead of him. Is he preparing a series of lectures for Athens on the Areopagus? Is he planning his next great church planting adventure? No, he's in neither of those places. He's in jail. His career's fallen apart. He's chained to a Roman guard. And to make matters worse, it seems likely that at any moment they could come in and have him executed by beheading. These are the circumstances in which we find this great leader, the Apostle Paul. And yet you heard the passage read, what we're going to see from Paul this morning is an incredible perspective on even these circumstances that makes him almost lift above them. He's found something, and I think he would mean for you and I to find it as well this morning. He's found a gospel perspective, a gospel lens, and if we could unlock it, if you could unlock it this morning, it very well might change your life whether you have been following Jesus for years or decades, or whether you come in here this morning, you're a total skeptic. You don't even know what's going on. For all of us in the room this morning, if we could unlock what Paul is talking about, if we could see it and take it, it very well might change your life. And I'm gonna package this this morning. I'm calling this gospel perspective in a series of what-if statements, all right? Here they are. What if your circumstances did not define your joy? Number two, what if other people's opinions of you, they didn't define you anymore? Number three, what if you were no longer anxious and afraid? Can you imagine it? To be set free from that anxiety and on the first three, if you're going, yes, I mean, I'd do anything for that. Then the last one's just really simple. What if you knew Paul's secret? What if he gave it away to you this morning? I think All of these can be yours when you leave this place that you could appropriate to your life and be set free this morning. If you have your Bibles, open them with me, Philippians chapter one. We're gonna continue our study. While you're turning there, um, let me just give a couple of announcements real fast. This is, I don't know how many of you are here in the room. Skeptics, you know, real big. If that's you, if you're going, I've got some really serious questions about the Bible. Maybe you grew up in church, but you've deconstructed uh, what you thought you believed growing up. Or maybe you, you've you been brought into this thing because somebody invited you. You don't exactly know why you're here. And this whole thing seems rather silly to you. Maybe you've got some massive questions about the Bible, Christianity, and you're going, I, until I square these, I don't know if I could be in. If any of those describe you, all right, that is my email, G A. Autry, A-U-T-R-Y at fellowshipnwa.org. What I would love to do is I want to invite you to email me. I would love to create some kind of a gathering. We might wait five weeks, six weeks, 10 weeks, something like that. If I can get 10 of you together to say we can meet at this time, then we're going to start meeting. Maybe meet for just a couple of months. Um, I would love to just create a space for us to be able to have some of these conversations. Uh, I promise we're not going to judge you for that conversation. I say all the time in here, if you've been coming to fellowship, hey, if you're a skeptic, and I mean it. So I'm trying to give us a place where we can get together and just process some of this honestly and openly. Now, if you are a Jesus follower, and maybe you are struggling with the big questions, but you want to know how to talk to skeptics, this ain't for you, all right? What's for you is discover good news. That's how you share the good news of Jesus in a culture that largely doesn't understand it. Now, we put it all on the screen so you can see the method to the madness. You hear us throwing out classes and offerings all the time. This is the big picture behind the curtain, how we want to train you as a Jesus follower at Fellowship Fayetteville. The discover, these are thing, this is the, the, the kinds of workshops that enable you to get out there and start living the life of obedience to Jesus. That's what Discover is built for. We have our more traditional classroom style, and we have two big classes there, Panorama of the Bible and Our Faith. And then we have our institute, which is seminary-level tra- seminary training that takes place on Wednesday mornings at 6.15 in the classroom. The things that are bolded, those are the things that are going on this fall, 
all right? So the things that are bolded, Discover Fellowship's happening right now, Good News and Discipleship, Our Faith, and we have our Gospels class. Those are, in case you can't see the bold. Um, if you are here and you're going, I, I really do wanna know what Christians believe and why we believe these things and how to communicate those things in this modern world. It's kind of hard to communicate those things. Well, starting next week, I'm gonna be walking us through this Our Faith class. It's our class on theology. What do Christians believe? We still have some spots available at the nine o'clock hour in the classroom, okay? It's an eight-week class where we're gonna try to help you understand what it is we believe so you can communicate it effectively. All of this, you can go to our website and find. QR code, gone. See you later. All right, what if... What if your circumstances did not dictate your joy? Think about it. First, I want us to to look at Paul. Let's let's observe from the life of Paul, then we're gonna see what the secret is. Look at what he says. Now, this is a very regular convention in the ancient Roman world. Uh, Oftentimes, when you write a letter, you would give an update, a personal update on things going on in your life. And Paul does the same same thing here. He says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me now, we, we already know what's happened to him. I've already given it away. Notice, and you might underline it. Look at the repetition in 13, 14, and 17. My chains, that I am in chains because of my chains. Trouble while I am in chains. What does this mean for Paul? You see, Paul has been arrested. He awaits trial that may lead to his death, and he finds himself under guarded house arrest in Rome capital of the empire. Literally, guards are brought in and they take shifts being chained to this man. His career that was climbing, man, the churches are being planted in the tank. All of the good news, what was happening as he hits these cities, it's come to a crashing halt. And he's looking up at gray walls and a guard next to him. I mean, how would you be feeling in the same circumstance? How would you be experiencing it? I, I, guess, I know for me, I'd be really frustrated. God, how could you allow this? Man, I was doing it out there. Things were working. And you put me here? What are you doing? Maybe you're asking that in a situation, a circumstance in your life right now. But I want you to notice what he says. He says that what has happened to me has actually served to. Now, I bolded the word. There are, there are two Greek words here that sound almost identical. I'll give you the two. The Greek word proskope means hindrance or setback. Notice the S, proskope. The Greek word prokope, minus the S, means advance, progress. Proskope, prokope. Okay, see the difference? I would bet everyone reading this letter, knowing he's in jail, is going, okay, okay, get ready. What has happened has actually served as a proscope, a great setback. I mean, I'm in jail. Look at what Paul says. Advance. Progress. This ain't stopping. This movement can't be stopped. Don't start feeling bad for me because I'm here. He's going to say a few verses later, The gospel continues to advance, and because of this, he says, I rejoice, and yes, I will rejoice. A few chapters later, just a few turns of the the scroll later, he'll say this. He goes, I've learned something. I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Chain him up, he says, that doesn't affect my joy. Let him go, doesn't affect my joy. Beat him down, you can't take my joy from me. Do you see this kind of buoyancy over even really difficult circumstances. Number two, what if people's opinions no longer had to define you? See, it it fascinates me that we live in a culture that has two opposing ideas that are both true at the same time, and we don't see the incongruity. See, we live in a culture that says that I determine truth myself, The aim of life is to discover who I am, you know, what I want to be, and then go live that out and don't let anybody get in my way otherwise. So at the one hand, we say, I affirm value and truth for myself. Yet at the exact same time, we we live in a culture where we are all so desperately in need 
of receiving value from the outside. So hear it. At the very same time, we say, I affirm truth from within. I determine meaning for myself. And yet, at the exact same time, we are 100% beholden in, in desperate need of affirmation from the outside. I, need, I determine truth, yet please affirm me at the exact same time. There's a lot of reasons as to how we got here culturally, but let's, let, me, let me help you see for a moment how we got here. A little cultural analysis. When you define truth from the internals, when I discover truth for myself, truth then becomes a relative concept in culture. We can't agree on it. It's personal to everyone. It's personal to each one of us. If we can't agree on what is true and what is virtuous and what is good and what is evil, then it makes it very difficult to talk about it. What can you then analyze? What can you then talk about? External things, superficial things, beauty and polish and charisma and talent and following. So at the same time we say, I'm free to determine my own value. I affirm value myself from within, and yet, please affirm me from the outside. How do you know? How do you know that you're in desperate need of affirmation from those on the outside? In short, how do you know that other people's opinions of you really define you? Let me give you just a quick test. On the one hand, are you crushed by critique? Are you crushed by critique? Maybe maybe even not just crushed by critique, do you find disagreement dangerous? Even just disagreement. Now, on the other hand, do you float with praise? Does, does recognition or affirmation send you to the moon? It might, it might demonstrate that as you take this little quick test, that you are beholden to the opinions of others, and most of us in this room are. Now, look at Paul, though. He says, verse 17, there's just two groups. Man, some are preaching Christ. They're doing it out of love, verse 16, but many are doing it from envy and rivalry and selfish ambition, not sincerely. They're supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I am in my chains. There are those that are heaping shame and upon Paul. They're maligning Paul in his prison experience. And then in verse 20, he says, but I desperately hope, in fact, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed. Why does he use the shame language here? Why all this shame language? See, in an honor-shame culture, like the Roman culture of the first century, your honor determines everything about your status in life. You can, you can be born with it. You can work to earn some of it. You can be born dishonored, and you can face shame and dishonor because of what happens in your life. To be thrown into jail is one of the ultimate expressions of this person's not on the honorable side. This is shameful. This is embarrassing. And for Paul, he's very used to this. See, all the way back when this movement called Christianity began to spread, it really spread through a city called Antioch. It's in modern-day Syria. And there in Antioch, as the followers of Jesus, they refer to themselves as the way. But it was there in Antioch that those from the broader culture began to refer to them not as the way, but as Christians. Christianos is the word. This word was not a compliment. It would be like saying, you little losers. You really affirming a guy that our guy killed on a cross? That kind of death? That's your hero? You little Christs. You little losers taking the side of the losers. And this becomes the badge that Christians wear. But look at Paul. He smirks at it. He goes, what does it matter? What does that matter to me? They could preach Christ out of selfish ambition. They could try to heap up shame on me. Doesn't matter. That doesn't define me. Can you imagine? Number three, what if you were no longer anxious and afraid? Notice Paul's language. He says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will not be put to shame, but have sufficient courage, confidence, boldness. That's the idea behind this word. Courage is a great translation. He says that no matter what happens to me, even if they kill me, 
Christ gets exalted. The famous words that many of you uh, have, have learned in your life, maybe memorized, we're going we're to teach them next week. They follow verse 20. Look at what he says. He says, to live is Christ. It's a die gain. Look at the confidence he has even in the face of death, maybe even a painful death. He goes, if I keep living in the body, even in chains, labor, fruitful labor. And if they kill me, I get to be with Christ. I get to depart and be with Christ. It's way better. I don't even know what to choose. Do you see this kind of courage? Even death, even imprisonment, even shame. He's like, doesn't scare me. I'm not anxious about that. Now, two minutes. Can you spare me two minutes? Let me do a quick two-minute aside on an important question that we actually get a little insight into here. Two-minute aside on this question. Jesus followers in the room, I hear it a lot. What happens after we die? Light topic, you know, mid-September morning. What happens after we die? Okay, I think we frequently talk about heaven uh, as the place that, that we go after we die. And when we think about heaven, I know for many of us in the room, something like this may come into our mind, like a big eternal worship service where we're in a giant arena uh, or weird you know, baby angel things kind of hovering around or like a blue, smoky, harp, baby angels, worship. I, I think for many of us, when we think about heaven, our immediate thought goes to some kind of a caricature from something like this. And I've talked to many of you, and you've been honest with me, and you said, it doesn't sound that great. I don't know if I want to go, okay? Um, and by the way, when it doesn't sound that great, you know what it makes you want to do? Maximize pleasure on earth, right? So let me just do a little corrective for us here. When the New Testament speaks about your eternal state, it talks about not going somewhere up there called heaven. No, no, it talks about a resurrection. The Christian hope is not a hope to escape the world. No, the Christian hope is a rescued world, a restored world, a redeemed world. Your body, the New Testament will say, will be resurrected physically. That is your eternal state. This is how I like to describe it. Listen, take one of those great days with great friendships and great conversation on an amazing hike to Hawksbill Crag. As you get there, as the sun comes up with an amazing sunrise, the fall leaves are changing. You had a great breakfast. You're going to have a great meal. As you come back, you're going to have great conversation, encouraging each other. Now, take away sin, add Jesus, and we're getting a fraction, a fraction. The Christian hope is a resurrection hope. Now, it leaves the question, what happens between death and our resurrection? What about that time period? And surprisingly, the New Testament is a little bit quiet, we might say, on it. Now, uh, shameless plug, I co-host a podcast called Out of Curiosity, and we have an episode called What Happens After We Die. And you can get 25 minutes on this, okay? But um, let me give you a little insight. From now in our resurrection, we only get a few verses. Jesus, in the Gospel of Luke, speaks to the man on the cross. We call him the thief on the cross. And he says, today you will be, hear it, with me in paradise. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says, to be away from the body at death and at home with the Lord. With the Lord. And here in Philippians, 2, or Philippians 1, Paul says, to depart and be with Christ is better by far. What might we say about it? And some of you, this is pertinent because many of us have lost loved ones that are in Christ, and we ask this question. What might we say? They are with Christ. To the point where Paul goes, can't wait. What does it look like? What is the experience? I'm not exactly sure. There's gonna be some things that we're not able to fill in, but we wanna get our hope clear. Our hope is a resurrection hope. In the short term, the intermediate we're with Christ. You with me? And it's this kind of hope, this kind of understanding that Paul says, oh man, I've got courage. 
is I'm going to be with Christ. He can smirk at even death. He can scoff as they say, we're going to keep you in jail. Bring it on. Now, I've tried to be intentionally provocative with the first three. And my hope would be that whether you're a Jesus follower for years, maybe you're not, and you're just here this morning, and you're like, man, I want that. What's the secret? How do I get that? I would love to have those first three said about me. So what is it? My question is, how much would you pay for that intellectual capital? Like, what would that be worth to you? If you, could, if you really knew it would work. It's ironic that in our modern world, I find that people are often promising big things. You know, here's, you know, here's a way to lose 20 pounds, and you can do so while also eating donuts. And here's a way to have business success as an entrepreneur, like a good example. Like this guy, I don't know if it's just my YouTube, but anytime I get on YouTube, there's a commercial for this guy, and he's always like doing one-handed pull-ups while eating a donut, and he's like, this can be you in 10 days. And I'm like, doubt it. Like, I doubt it. Um, one-handed pull-ups, eating the donut. And uh, one, so fi finally, one time, I was like, fine. I clicked on it. And uh, it takes you to a test, which then takes you to a website, which then all, the, all these promises, and eventually, you got to pay something for it. Um, Sarah and I lost, uh, this is the most silly example, Sarah and I lost both of our dogs that were like 14 and 13, notebook style, like back to back, okay? And uh, so we were like, we, we bit the bullet, we got another dog, a little puppy, and I've never in my life had a small dog. It's a little small Yorkie. Um, <laughs> I'm adjusting. So I was uh, looking on, I Googled it, you know, how do you like uh, train a dog like this, a little dog? And they were like, they're super stubborn, they're impossible to train. I was like, good start. Um, and so I got, I was looking at potty training, other things, and uh, started looking, there was this website. I've been working with Yorkies for 30 plus years. I know the secret, and it kept going on and on. I'm reading this thing, it's like, you can do this, you can do that. They're super smart, no time, I'll give you the secret. Got to the very end, you gotta pay for the book. And you gotta pay for a subscription. The Everything Yorkie Terrier book, I bet they've sold dozens of copies. Max, this thing. And I'm like, you're over-promising here. Just give me the secrets. And I think what we're gonna see this morning is Paul will give it away for free. He's gonna tell you. Let's look at it. What, do you need to, what if you knew the secret? He says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. And we're gonna go back to fill in some of these gaps in a minute. You see, I think Paul knows something. Paul knows that whatever your bottom line in life is, whatever your absolute value is, whatever is the thing that you say, this is how I know I matter. This thing is what tells me my life was successful. Whatever that is ultimately drives everything else about your life. Everything else will fall in line behind that thing. Thomas Oden is a, a writer, theologian. He says it this way. It's, it's, he says, you have to watch for your absolute value. He says, an absolute value for me is the center of value that makes all my other values valuable. He says, bitterness becomes neurotically intensified when someone or something stands between me and something that is my ultimate value. Let me put it to you really simply. How would you fill in this blank? I mean, everything in my life, the things going on around me, they've served to advance what? How do you fill in this blank? What you fill in the blank with will define your destiny. And everything else in your life will be derivative of what you fill in the blank with. Odin continues. It says, suppose my God is sex or my physical health or the Republican Party. If I experience any of these under genuine threat, then I feel myself shaken to the depths. Guilt becomes intensified to the degree, hear him, that I have idolized finite values. So he's a teacher. So he says, suppose I value my ability to teach and communicate clearly. If clear communication has become an absolute value for me, a center of value that makes all other values valuable, then if I fail in teaching well, I am stricken with guilt. We got to have some honest assessment. How would you fill in this blank this morning? If you were to say, uh, my business success, not a bad thing, like working hard, business success. 
if that's your absolute value, then you will be 100% tethered to the circumstances of the business. You will be constantly worried about people around you. Do they see me as a good leader? Do they see me as a good entrepreneur, as a good CEO, whatever it may look like? And you'll have this gnawing sense of anxiety, even when things are going well, because it'll never feel like it's enough. Let's say you fill in the blank with uh, happy, well-adjusted, comfortable, successful kids. By the way, not a bad thing to aspire to. But if that's what you fill in the blank with, that's your absolute value, then the circumstances of their success or failure, whether they start or don't start on the team, the circumstances of their grades, their future spouse, whether they meet them or not, you will be tethered to those circumstances. You'll constantly be afraid of the opinions of others. What if they get seen as disobedient? What if they aren't seen as the cool one or the funny one or whatever it may be? You'll be worried. It reflects on you. And you'll be constantly anxious. What if they don't live up? What if I'm not doing enough? What if this happens? What if that happens? You'll be anxious. Suppose you fill in the blank with finding a spouse and getting married. A good thing to want. But you fill in the blank with that. Now, your circumstances, people's opinions, your anxiety goes up. You're tethered to it. You put in there just the good old American life, American dream, same thing. What do you fill in the blank? Now look at what Paul says. He says, the gospel. Don't miss it. It's a Christian-y word, and we use it a lot, but I don't want us to miss what it means, okay? Let's be really clear. Two pieces of, quote, the gospel. Hear it. If we miss what the definition of the gospel is, you'll miss the point. What is the gospel? Two things. If you were to walk around in the ancient Roman Empire saying, I've got a gospel. The word gospel means good news. It's an announcement. If you were to start walking around the Roman Empire saying, I heard a gospel, I've got a gospel, they're gonna go, yeah, 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 we know about gospels. They're about king and kingdom and power and politics. Gospel announcements are about Caesar and victories. Gospel announcements are about the kingdom advancing. This stone right here, it's an ancient propaganda, ancient billboard that was found in what we now call Turkey. Back then they called it Galatia. Paul actually went there and wrote a letter to this area. And on this inscription, we can see um, how this gospel sounds, okay? I'm going to highlight some things for you. Since the order of the gods or providence has set in most perfect order to give us who? Caesar Augustus, the most high. He's our savior. He ends war. He arranges all things. He surpasses all other benefactors. He brings success. See the line. And since the birthday of the God Augustus was the beginning of the UN Galeon, the good news for the world. Gospels are about king and kingdom, conquest and victory. If you were to ask a Jewish person, what's the gospel? They would almost certainly take you to Isaiah 52. Remember, the Bible was written from a Jewish community with a Jewish perspective about a Jewish Messiah. And here's what a Jewish person would say. Hey, I've got a gospel. What is it? He'd say, how beautiful in the mountains are the feet of those who bring the gospel, good news, who proclaim peace, who bring the gospel, good tidings, and proclaim salvation. But what is the content? They say to Israel, to Zion, your God reigns. Yahweh is coming to you. He returns to you. What is the gospel to a Jewish person? It's the announcement that Yahweh is coming back to rescue his people, to forgive his people, to set them free. Putting those two things together. What is the gospel? It is the announcement that Jesus is Israel's Messiah, the one who comes to deal with the problem of sin and the world's true king. By the way, this is why Paul begins this letter by saying, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the King, Lord Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. He repeats these three words over and over and over and over again in Philippians. Start marking it. It's the gospel. Now, what kind of king does the gospel proclaim? A king unlike the world's ever seen. A king the world desperately needs. We quote this all the time, and rightly so. Jesus himself would say, you know what this king is like? He came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. 
Paul says that's the absolute value. That's the center that holds everything else around it. I've oriented to that, and it's changed everything for me. It makes him unstoppable. Literally, he goes, it's all serving to advance the gospel. So he says, look, I'm chained to guards. Sweet. I got a live audience. They're going to rotate these guards in every single few hours. Get ready. About to tell them about this king. He says, later on, they go, imagine trying to stop him. They go, Paul, you're killing us, man. We're going to kill you with Christ. Better. Okay, Paul, we're going to let you out. Ministry can't stop me. Fine, we're going to beat you down. He goes, if I am weak, then he is strong. Bring it on. Can you imagine this kind of a poise? Now, here's how we close. I'm really afraid, as we, as we think about our list here, I'm really afraid that you hear this and go, man, I kind of want to be like Paul. That's cool. Paul's our hero. Oh, he's a hero, though. Man, he, he's one of the greats, right? I couldn't be like that. I mean, we're still reading stuff he wrote. He wrote some of the Bible, after all. I'm not like that. I think if Paul were standing right here, he'd go, oh, how wrong you have it. How you've missed it. I think he'd say, I'm nothing special. I'm not brilliant. It's not wise. I understood the secret. I think he'd say this. Do you see him? Do you see your king and what he's there? We're going to look at these words a few weeks from now. Notice the poetry. The one who is in the very nature of God empties himself so that he might be exalted. Notice the triplets, how they all match. What, is that, what line does that leave? Even death on a cross. Our king emptied himself for you and for me. I think Paul would say, just see him. See how far he was willing to go for you. See, the death and the resurrection of Jesus means that even the worst circumstances, you can have joy that is impervious to them. The death and resurrection of Jesus means that now his, his word spoken over you is what defines you, holy and blameless and chosen and adopted and loved. The death and resurrection of Jesus means that even death you can smirk at. The death and resurrection of Jesus means that even in chains, you advance. Paul understood the secret. You behold him. And you look at him. You're captivated by him. That secret can be yours this morning if you would take it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for sending your son to be king, but a king unlike any other. And Jesus, we behold you. We see you. And we want to define our value and our worth in light of what you've done for us. It's not our own, but it comes from you. And so Jesus, we thank you that at the same time, we are so unworthy of your love for us, so unworthy of your grace to us, and yet because of your grace, you make us worthy, found our worth in you. So Jesus, as we now turn to sing to you and praise you, it's our prayer that we would hear the secret, unlock this secret by looking at you and beholding you, that you would set us free even right now this morning. We need you, Jesus, and pray this in your name as our King. Amen.